just in case you hadn't noticed, we're in a very strange environment. We can't get out and about to see you at the moment, which is something we very much enjoy doing because it means we can find out what it is that you need and we can tailor our services. So I had to do things differently this year and this is one of them. So I've got uh, Laura with me today. Uh, you can't see her, but everything that you are seeing and experiencing is because of her. She's organized these things. And for that, we're extremely grateful. Um, we're obviously also grateful to um, our predecessors of this country that we stand on. So let's acknowledge that. Um, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm actually going to read this out because I think it's important that we, we do acknowledge this. Ossert through the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who, who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So without further ado, we might jump into today's webinar. So we'll start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're, we're running on TLP uh, Green today. So that means that you're free to share this. And in fact, we will actually, we're, we're recording it and we will actually post this up on our YouTube later on. So if any of your colleagues um, or friends couldn't make it today, uh, feel free to share this with them afterwards if they uh, feel the urge to listen to my very entertaining voice. A um, couple of other things, um, if, if, oh, sorry, one thing I should mention, if you're not sure about the TLPs, uh, just pop over to the uh, web link that we've got on our slides and you can learn all about it. It's very important to understand that sort of thing. A um, couple of other housekeeping things. We are going to do questions and answers. Um, we will use the Q&A function in Zoom for that. So uh, we'll just keep an eye on uh, those things as they come through and we'll either answer them live or we'll just type a response. Um, but feel free to ask questions. So what we're going to do is um, today we'll, we'll go through a little bit of history of uh, what a phishing scam uh, looks like. Um, and I've got a couple of reasons for doing that. So bear with me if, if you already know what phishing is, um, bear with me. Uh, then I want to talk about what our internal process is here. Because sometimes, I know myself personally, I used to really enjoy uh, some of the presentations OSCERT did back uh, oh, probably 15 years ago or so when I was very new in cybersecurity. I learned a lot from uh, th this sort of presentation uh, from the analysts that worked at OSCERT at the time. Um, so I, I just wanted to share a little bit about what we do internally so that you might be able to experience that same um, excitement of learning, I suppose. Um, then we're going to go into um, why uh, we do certain things the way we do them and why sharing that information is very important. Um, most importantly, and this is probably the bit that you're all wanting to hear and we'll spend quite a bit of time on this, what actually can we do and, and what can't we do under the phishing takedown service? So we'll, we'll explain that in great detail so that it all makes sense. Um, and then I'll talk really briefly about what the future of this service will be, um, what you can look forward to for next year. Um, so let's dive into the history. So if, if anyone's sort of relatively new to the industry, you might not have um, been, been around when some of the, the more, more uh, historical attacks occurred back in the uh, 60s, 70s and even the 80s. Um, well before we had things like email, uh, hackers decided that they wanted to hack the telephone system. And because things weren't digital and the control of, of the exchanges was done with audio tones, uh, they, they quickly figured out, well, hang on, if we learn what all these audio tones are and play them back down the telephone line, we might be able to um, get long distance uh, phone calls for free or figure out some other way to, to hack telephone calls. So that's exactly what they did. And they became known as freakers because obviously you could you know, use the extension of the word phone, um, audio frequency. There are a lot of PH or F <laughs> sounds there. So the, words, the word freakers was born to describe a telephone system hacker. So when, when um, you know, the eighties rolled on and digital exchanges obviously put a stop to that because the control was outside of the band of um, the audio tones, so you couldn't hear it, you couldn't hack it. Um, fortunately for all of the malicious uh, people out there, that was when email was born, so of course phishing scams were born. All right, so now let's, let's take a look at um, where that went. Now, obviously, attackers have to, they've got to have a goal. They've got to have um, some, some reason for doing what they're doing. And this is really important to, to think about when you're doing your risk assessment. 
a very wise person once told me as a, um, a very young infosec person uh, 20 years ago, you've got to think like your attacker. You've got to think of every single way that your attacker is going to try and attack you and you've got to plug all the gaps. He or she, the attacker, only has to think of one and get through and if it's the one that you haven't plugged. So the reason I say that is everyone for a long time thought phishing was the realm of banks and obviously that, that was a lucrative business until the banks got hold of it. Then what we started to see maybe 10, five years ago, we saw that sort of pivot into other industries and the other industries weren't ready for it. So it's taken a long time for everyone to catch up. Now, what that meant is attacks could actually use um, information gleaned through a phishing attack to pivot into other systems. So a number of incidents that I personally worked on and then uh, the team has worked on since then um, have actually involved a simple phishing attack, just like the one you see on the screen there, seemingly an innocent phishing, just trying to get into your, your uh, online um, email. But from there, because that's probably tied to your active, active directory credentials, the attacker then had access to an internal environment, maybe could log into the email system as that user. And we started to see attacks where they do clever things like use a mailbox to pivot outwards into a company um, and things got a lot more serious. So those are the sorts of things that you've got to think about in your risk assessment to say, well, is, is phishing actually a problem to me? or is it something that we don't need to worry about? I'd actually suggest it's, it's something everyone needs to worry about for all of those reasons. So that was why I wanted to dive into history so that you could sort of see why I was saying, hey, this is important, even if you're not a bank. Um, I don't think anyone really thinks that way these days, but um, just in case you're looking for, um, I guess, business case ideas and, and uh, things to, to um, use with your management as to why you're doing things about phishing and implementing controls, this is certainly something that you could mention. All right, so now that we know the history of it all, let's take a really quick look through what the internal process at OSET is. Now, this is obviously a really simplified diagram that I've whipped up here. Um, there's, there's obviously a lot more complex um, procedures and systems in place here. And in fact, it's actually built up over, um, well, we've been around for 27 years and phishing has been a thing for most of that time. Um, so we've actually built up quite a good reputation around the world with hosting providers, um, domain registrars and other certs. Um, now that comes in really, really handy, obviously, when we say, uh, please, Mr. or Mrs. Hosting Provider, could you take this, this site down? Um, personally, I remember doing this myself at a bank uh, that I worked at and before, you know, phishing takedowns as a service was a thing we used to actually phone the hosting providers ourselves and ask politely, can you take the site down? And you'd either get crickets on the end of the line or very occasionally someone would actually say, oh, I see we've got a phishing scam there, no problems, I'll just go right ahead and delete that for you. And you know, everything was hunky-dory. Um, I assume you probably don't wanna be doing that yourself. So we have those relationships all built up. Um, we also have the capability to analyze phishing scams in great detail. Um, for those that aren't sort of aware, I suppose, a phishing scam can be anything from, oh, hey, can you just click this link and type your details in, all the way through to a Trojan dropper or something that can actually um, do that silently by itself so that you don't actually have to interact with anything. You can just visit a site, compromise a machine, and then collect as many credentials as you like as an attacker. So you may not want to actually visit a phishing site yourself in order to analyze it. Obviously, we've got systems in-house that can do that and procedures and processes to make sure that we can do it safely. So um, please obviously make use of that and send it to us rather than necessarily wanting to do it yourself. So you can see from the diagram there, we can either detect them ourselves, you can tell us about it, we analyze it. Um, we actually have a really cool system these days that was uh, designed in-house by one of the analysts. Um, I'm not sure if he's on the, the audience, but I'll embarrass him anyway, his name's Eric. Um, and he's come up with a really interesting way of um, using some open source tools to capture the artifacts of that phishing scan um, so that we can basically capture it as soon as it's, it's seen before it changes or before it's taken down, um, capture a, a screenshot of it, capture all the little bits and pieces of it for later analysis and to show you as, as the uh, requester of a phishing takedown. So that clever little system was, was named Osprey 
Um, and you see that down the bottom there where it says capture artifacts. Um, so that plays a very big part of um, the, the team's internal process now for figuring out what happens in a phishing scam. So uh, we're very grateful to all the work that Eric and the others in the team have also put into on that system. Um, obviously from there, you can decide, no, we actually can't take that down and we'll get into the reasons why that might be in just a moment. Um, or yes, we initiate the takedown process. Now you'll notice across the top there, there's the ticketing system overseeing everything. Now we're using an open source ticketing system here uh, called Request Tracker, but obviously there's some heavy customization for managing this process end to end. It can do cool things like send automated or semi-automated responses, things like pre-crafted, um, please take this phishing site down, uh, requests to hosting and, and uh, domain registrars. So uh, that system that you'll see across the top there is, is basically overseeing all of that. And it makes the analyst lives a little easier, but obviously you can see that every step of this process is very um, analyst intensive. It requires someone with a lot of skill. Fortunately, that's exactly what we have here in the, the OSET operations team. So that's how it works. Um, let's move on now to um, moving on from there, we'll move on to um, why we actually uh, send the, um, the data in those things out to you by way of, of feeds. So the very last step in that process you would have seen was uh, add it to the OSIRT feeds like the malicious URL feed and um, our MISP instance here. So why do we do that? Well, um, we don't just do it for fun. We make sure that those feeds are actually a very high competence, uh, but essentially low volume because they're high competence uh, feed of indicators that you can then use. Uh, now we've, we've actually got a whole webinar on, on what the malicious URL feed is, and you can find that on our YouTube channel. But just very quickly, the reason we give you that is so that you can actually search for these uh, phishing attacks in your environment. You can either block them or uh, detect them after the fact so that you can go chasing them. Now, uh, back at the beginning when we were talking about the, the risk profile that you might have uh, come up with to decide whether phishing is important or not, um, basically spear phishing, phishing, all of the uh, malicious attacks that can come through email um, or, or web, because obviously there's a web component, all of these sorts of things generally have indicators. We're very fortunate that we're, um, we cover a lot of Australia with, with you, our members. So our detection range for this is, is quite large. So that means that those feeds are quite accurate. That's the latest up to the minute um, malware droppers, phishing sites, spear phishing um, sites that are used in those sorts of attacks, that's all there in the feed. So sharing is caring. Um, if, if you give it to us, we can distill it, analyze it, pop it into the feeds and send it back out to everyone. The more people that have it, the more people are protected. So that's why we do it. And uh, we've, we've been banging on about um, and I've, I've particularly put a little um, photo, uh, a little image there from, from the uh, Circle team over in Luxembourg that come out with the MISP platform. Um, share your bloody indicators. That's something that's extremely important these days. Uh, I've known uh, sharing circles, I guess you'd call them, uh, probably for you know almost as long as I've been in the cybersecurity industry, which frighteningly is coming up to 20 years now. Um, it started in the banking industry where they were actually sharing things like uh, mule accounts. So obviously when you send money around, you have to use mules to cover your tracks and you know, make sure you use a couple of mules to funnel the money through. Mules um, were generally well aware of what they were doing and they were given a cut of, of, uh, of the phishing proceeds, I suppose, but they obviously still had to have account numbers. So the banks used to share those account numbers between them. So that as soon as one popped up, they'd know, oh yeah, that one's being used for fraud. Then they started sharing the URLs of the phishing attacks and that started being shared around. Um, there, was, there was actually a very talented InfoSec person who I believe now works over in Telstra, who at the time uh, set up one of the, the world's, uh, certainly Australia's first repository of phishing URLs. And he just did that because he wanted to. And amazingly, all the banks actually started using it. Um, now that was that was a great example of, of threat sharing, but it wasn't sustainable for that person. He actually got um, dosed off the planet basically by the, the fishers once they realized what he was doing. So um, that's definitely something that we encourage everyone to do. We like helping 
industry groups get off the ground and um, start using any technology, be it ours or someone else's. The university court at ISAC is a very good example of that, which we actually set up ourselves and used to share these sorts of indicators um, in a small group. There's other groups in Australia that do it. And if you're not part of one for your industry, um, definitely seek one out. There's the JCSCs in your capital cities, there's us. Um, if you go to your local ASA meetups, you'll be able to find like-minded people that might be able to point you in the right direction for your own industry. If one doesn't exist for your industry, well, talk to someone, talk to us, talk to the JCSC, and whoever's best place to do it might be able to get a little threat sharing group up off the ground if there's enough interested people that want to do it. Um, and you know, actually start sharing some bloody indicators. So I'll just put that little plug in there for community sharing before we move on to the next thing, which, which is really the guts of what I wanted to talk about today. So the next slide is what can we actually do? So I've brushed over a couple of things here um, without actually describing them in detail. So I wanna pop back to a few concepts here. So whilst fishing has been around for a, a very long time, it comes in all different forms. And one of the forms that sometimes gets wrapped up into fishing is a brand impersonation. So imagine a case where, um, like if it was Osset, some, some very uh, nasty malicious person decided to register a domain that looks and sounds like osset.org.au, but in fact isn't, and then set up an entire brand and started trading using, essentially using our good name. Um, now that generally isn't something that's easy to prove. So once you come to uh, the hosting provider or the domain registrar and say, hey, that's a fake site. Um, if it has a, a registered business number or if it's overseas and it, it has some kind of um, status that makes it look like a legitimate business, but it just happens to be very similar to your brand, the hosting providers and registrars generally aren't that interested in shutting it down because it looks like a legitimate business. So at that point, you're obviously, uh, the onus is almost on you as an organization to prove that you had the brand first. So you'll need an intellectual property lawyer or something like that. Now, we, we obviously can't do that, we're not lawyers. And uh, we, we do know a couple of people in the industry who are very good at that. Now, also it never aligns with external entities, but we can certainly point you in the direction of a couple and say, look, um, this is an intellectual property case. Um, it, it can't be dealt with with a fishing takedown. Please um, pop over here and um, have a chat to, to your legal representation. Now, the reason that I wanted to make this distinction is sometimes it's very difficult to actually ascertain, you know, is this something that Osset's fishing service can, can take down for you? Um, so generally, if, you, if, you, if you're not sure, sure, send it, send it in to us, we can have a look at it. But if it's a clear case of brand impersonation where intellectual property is, is the target, um, unfortunately we can't. Now let's talk about why we can't do that. Back to the hosting providers, they look at those things and see legitimate business. They can't get into the ins and outs of, is it someone else's intellectual property or not? Because that becomes very subjective. That's why there's a whole section of law that deals with it. So uh, we've always had to stay away from that because the hosting providers will just say to us, no, that's a legal thing. Now, coming back to our reputation, we've got that strong reputation with the hosting providers and the overseas cert teams not to cry wolf. So if we go to them and say, hey, this is a phishing scam, um, we'd like to be very certain that they're not going to turn around and say, well, there's nothing fraudulent going on here. It might be infringing on someone else's uh, trademark, but that's a matter for the lawyers. So we have to be very careful that we don't um, upset the hosters and uh, get into that sort of situation where our reputation is tarnished. At the moment, um, that good reputation directly benefits you because when we say to those, those providers, can we take the site down? At least we don't hear back crickets. Uh, generally, they'll say, oh, yep, that's right. You're the second oldest cert in the world. We think you know what you're doing. Um, sure, we'll investigate. Uh, now let's talk about, uh, let's talk about bulletproof hosting. Sorry, Laura, my bad. One, um, back on the, old, the other slide. Um, let's talk about bulletproof hosting. It is exactly what it says on the label. Organized crime has a really good foothold into certain countries to make sure that if a phishing scam is hosted there, it darn well stays there. And no amount of pleading from us or from uh, law enforcement um, or even the local cert usually 
uh, is likely to bring that site down. Now, we get a bit of a feel over time for who those hosting providers are. They're either actually organized crime or they're uh, <laughs> controlled by organized crime. Um, and you can sort of read into that any way you like. But essentially that means that no one's gonna be able to take phishing sites down from those providers. We'll certainly try. And we've got contacts with just about every cert team around the world so that we can say, having trouble with this one, it's not coming down. Um, if there's anything you can do. And usually that gets the local law enforcement involved eventually when enough of these sorts of requests come through. Um, but we all know organized crime is exactly what it says on the tin. So sometimes I guess you just need to set expectations around whether or not those will be able to be taken down. All right, so uh, the next slide that I had is actually not really something that um, I guess the, the average uh, IT person needs to read. Um, but the reason I wanted to give you this, and, and we will give you these slides later on, that's no problem. Um, the reason I wanted to give you this is, this is actually an excellent analogy. Um, it, it was come up with, uh, come up uh, by uh, Jeff, our operations manager. Um, and this analogy explains the, the pitfalls and the difficulties of phishing takedowns in a very simple analogy of, of potholes in a road. Now, the reason I'm giving you this is we've had a lot of problems um, helping our members over the years when we've had to come back to the member and say, we think we might be dealing with a bulletproof hoster or we know that this is an intellectual property case and you're going to have to go to your legal representation. We've had troubles there uh, between us and the member helping them to bring that understanding to their management because obviously if, if you're being targeted by a phishing scam, your management's bleeding funds, uh, revenue's not coming in. They're obviously just sort of, um, you know, cracking the whip over the team saying, hey, come on, isn't this phishing site coming down? And sometimes in the heat of the moment, it's very difficult to explain, well, actually, we've done all we can um, internally. We've asked OSSERT, OSSERT's done all they can. Um, but this analogy is actually a really good way of explaining those pitfalls. So I thought I'd give you this slide that you can take away Essentially, the end goal is the same. We're trying to make the road as safe as possible to travel down, but you might come across um, a couple of potholes here and there. Will they be patched? I say patched because this is IT and that's kind of funny. Um, or will they just be sort of filled in and, you know, just with dirt or something and, and it won't actually stick? And that's an exact analogy of what can happen. I mean, a fishing site can go down because it gets sort of filled in with dirt and then it can go back up again. Um, we see that all the time. If the hosting provider doesn't plug whatever vulnerability was open to allow the attacker in, it'll just be opened up right again. So some of those things are sort of explained in this analogy and um, I won't dwell on it too much now because I know the audience we have here is generally uh, educated infosec people, but this is something that I thought would be an awesome thing to take away to your, your management if you're having trouble explaining why it isn't, uh, isn't working the way that you were all hoping it would. So that's, um, that's something you can take away. Now, last, the last thing that I wanted to jump into is uh, what we'll actually do in the future. Now, we, um, we're not, we haven't actually got this in the 2020 roadmap at the moment. So um, this is something that we'll um, uh, come on to in uh, probably 2021 but we're not going to commit to any, any timelines just at this moment because obviously this is the year that uh, everything kind of went off the rails in terms of timing. So uh, what we want to do is we want to give you a much better uh, view of what's happening to your fish. So if you report a, f a fishing site and say, I'd like this taken down, um, it would be reasonable for you to expect to be able to track that to completion through a member portal. So that's the end goal and we will work towards that. We just don't have that in our timeline for this year. Um, so I'll be able to come back and update you next year on how we're getting along with that. Um, one of the things though that's extremely important, as I've said, is those overseas contacts. Most of the phishing sites obviously are overseas and having those contacts um, that, that we can call out to, uh, particularly if we're having, having bad luck with a, with a hosting provider or whatever, having those providers is extremely important. Now, the one thing that we haven't skimped out on um, this year, even though obviously everyone's budget is strained, is making sure we don't 
lose those ties with overseas communities. There's two really good ones um, called FIRST, uh, which has been around longer than we have, and um, AP Cert. FIRST is worldwide. Um, forum of uh, incident response and security teams. Uh, something you might want to check out personally, actually, if you're interested in your organization joining that to benefit from uh, everything that they can offer as a worldwide community. Um, however, we obviously can bring some of that expertise through our contacts uh, to you. AP Cert is exactly what it says. It's the Asia Pacific Cert teams. There's uh, just under 30 teams, I think, at the moment that make that up in the Asia Pacific area. And that's a, a really good way to maintain those contacts. So we act, we're actually extremely active in um, especially the AP Cert teams so that we can maintain those contacts for you to make sure that we can get those results. So uh, we're actually increasing that this year rather than decreasing it. So that's, that's where the, the roadmap is going. Now, I believe that is just about it. So we'll, we'll turn over to questions. Um, if I haven't bored you all to tears, this, um, this picture you see on the slides now was actually uh, drawn by a good friend of mine, Mandy, who I'm sure a lot of you know. Uh, when I was actually talking in person at one of our um, meetups, and I think I might have bored her a little bit because she actually drew me as a cat and uh, there I am at the top and there's the lectern I was standing in front of and a bunch of cats sort of standing around it. So I just thought that was a really interesting uh, uh, picture that she drew. So I'm sharing it with you all. So do we have any questions? That either means I've done an extremely good job or an extremely bad job. <laughs> we'll give it a couple of moments. Um, in the chat. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Sorry, I'm looking at the Q&A window. Let me jump over to the chat window. Alrighty. Uh, right, so preferred method of reporting phishing to OSIRT. Uh, basically, email is, is the easiest for the team. So I'll, I'll favour that one simply because it means that they can process it straight into their ticketing system. Um, obviously the ticketing system monitors the email and creates tickets automatically. So it just all sort of flows through. Um, if that's not your preferred way, you could also give it to us through the member Slack. Um, the, the response times through Slack though, may be slower than through email. Um, we have actually had in the past, we've had members create their own little uh, scripts and, and things to take things out of their environment that have been trapped and dump it into either email or I think in the old days we used to do it through IRC and um, you know that that meant we could sort of go through it and, and process it and um, take it that way so there are options if you'd like to talk about what your particular favorite way of reporting phishing might be uh, maybe just drop us a line to OSIRT at OSIRT uh, you know things that I envisage we would do in the future when we have that um, member portal tracking phishing is perhaps there'll be an API way that you'll be able to just electronically send it straight to us. Um, that's a long way down the track. Um, actually, there we go. Someone's actually just suggested a, a, a MISP API and you know, maybe that's how we'll do it. Maybe we'll do it through MISP. Um, give us some ideas. Uh, we might even do a quick poll or something and see what everyone thinks is the best idea. Um, just jumping through the questions. Um, Oh, one I missed, sorry. Also from Tristan, uh, what is the process for phishing uh, CDNs, Google, Office 365, that sort of stuff? Um, we've got some pretty good inroads into, into them for reporting purposes as well. So uh, yeah, just from your point of view, treat it exactly the same way. Um, send it to us and we can, we can deal with it. We're actually quite lucky, um, particularly in the Microsoft front, in that the university has a lot of contacts there as well. So uh, that's not a problem. All right. Um, we are almost out of time, but I think we have time for more questions if anyone has any. Uh, so I'll just quickly pause. There's one on the Q&A. One in Q&A. <laughs> so someone has just said, um, uh, Mike has just said SendGrid allows 40,000 free emails to just about anyone. Um, yeah, that's, that's not cool. 
<laughs> so there's, um, there's obviously uh, tools out there that the attackers can use to their disadvantage. Um, I guess stopping something like that where it's effectively legitimate business, I'm not sure that we're going to be effective there. Perhaps controls might be a better way of, uh, of, of stopping those sorts of things. When I've had to do this personally myself, when we've been, we've been suffering phishing attacks, um, obviously you want some kind of cloud level or, or provider level uh, control over it and throttle it at that level. Um, that might be something you could do to stop something like that coming through if you know there was an attack. I'm not sure that we're going to be effective stopping something that is effectively um, normal business. Um, next question we have here, so I'm reading and thinking at the same time, which is not my forte. Uh, are there any cyber awareness training materials with respect to phishing? Uh, we don't personally have any, but there are absolutely tons of that sort of stuff online. Uh, now, Melissa, I'm not sure what industry you're in. If you're in one of the universities, they are actually in the process of sourcing and sharing all of that sort of stuff. Um, if you're in a different industry, uh, there, there are numerous free things out there that you can use. Uh, a lot of the vendors are actually providing that material for free now and you can just brand it with your own company. Um, so that's probably a good place to start looking for that. That's actually why we're not doing it because there's so much out there. Um, is uh, just going to the next question is your evidence gathering tool publicly available not yet but one of the things uh it's actually on our um our bhag list our, our big hairy audacious goal list was to become a contributor to or better contributor to open source we have contributed to open source over the years um, a number of the team here have contributed to um, mist for example through Circle, but uh, we haven't actually hosted our own project yet. So yes, that is definitely something we'd consider perhaps down the track. Um, next question. Um, ah, so someone has actually referenced, uh, I think this is in relation to your question, Melissa, about, yep, there we go. Paul's actually just answered that one for us. Charles Sturt University has uh, some, some good free online courses that they run. Um, on that sort of awareness. So uh, like I said, there's tons of free stuff out there. I would be, I would encourage you to support the um, uh, universities if, if at all possible. We're, we're doing it tough at the moment with the coronavirus. So um, there's a plug for Charles Sturt. Um, I think all the other questions have basically been answered now. Have we missed any? Did I miss any, Laura? We're good. All right. Um, we are a bit over time, but I, I didn't want to miss any of the questions. So uh, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your time with us today. And it's been fun bringing this information to you. So the next thing, of course, uh, for us at least, is the uh, OSIRT Cybersecurity Conference, which is uh, 14th to the 15th to the 18th. I really should know that. So please, uh, if you haven't already registered, jump on over there. And it will be a pleasure to see you online over there at the OSET conference, which uh, for the first time is online. And I know from all of the things that Laura and Beck have been doing that there is some really exciting stuff in store for you. It's not just an online conference. So would love to see you all there. And thank you very much for attending today. We'll see you then.